All right, good morning again, everyone, and thanks so much for attending today. My name is Elizabeth Calderon, and I'm the Senior Food Security Analyst at FuseNet, responsible for Latin America and the Caribbean. Today, I'll be presenting our Central America Food Security Outlook Briefing for the period of March to September of 2023. So we'll start off as usual with a brief overview of FuseNet's approach to early warning analysis and the IPC 3.1 food security classification system. We'll go through our key messages for the outlook period, an overview on the current situation that will cover both our presence country of Guatemala, as well as the remote monitoring countries of Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. Then we'll cover our assumptions that we've developed for this outlook period, and at the end, discuss our projected outcomes for the region. So what FUSENET um, does is we start off with an eight-step process called the scenario development. And we begin this with our understanding of local livelihoods and how poor households typically access food and income. So this knowledge base helps us to determine what information from the field we need to collect. And then we'll draw on and analyze all of the relevant and available information. And typically that includes agroclimatology, markets and trade data, and more. We're using all of that to determine current food security outcomes. Knowing our current food security outcomes, we are able to develop evidence-based assumptions about key drivers and anomalies. And then those assumptions help us to project the extent to which poor households, food and income sources are either likely or unlikely to cover their minimum food needs during the projection period. Now, minimum food needs, again, we're talking about an average of 2,100 kilocalories today. And we use those projections to classify the most likely food security outcomes. We do that first at the household level and then at the area level, which you're used to seeing in our maps. At the end of the process, we identify events that although we don't expect them to happen, they are possible. And if they were to happen, they would change the scenario and our outcomes. So in terms of what this looks like, FuseNet utilizes the global IPC scale. The scale KISS consists of five phases of increasing severity. And if you look at the top of the slide, you can see those different phases with their corresponding colors. They begin at none at the household level or minimal at area level. And this is IPC phase one seen there in green. And this is when households are able to meet their basic food and non-food needs. Stressed or IPC phase two indicates that households have minimally adequate consumption but they may be unable to afford essential non-food needs without negative coping. And then phases three and higher, which are all included in the dotted box there in the top right of the slide, all of these phases require urgent humanitarian food assistance because households either have food consumption gaps or they are engaging in unsustainable coping strategies in order to mitigate those gaps. Households in crisis or IPC phase three are either experiencing food consumption gaps reflected by high or above normal acute malnutrition, or they're only minimally meeting their food needs through negative coping that depletes essential life, livelihood assets. Emergency or IPC phase four includes when households have large food consumption gaps that is reflected in very high acute malnutrition and excess mortality, or they're mitigating those gaps through employing emergency livelihood strategies and full asset liquidation. Lastly, the most severe phase is catastrophe at the household level or famine at area level. And this indicates an extreme lack of food and other basic needs, even after the full employment of coping strategies. In catastrophe and famine, we expect to see evidence of death, destitution, and extremely critical acute malnutrition levels. But just as a reminder for the Central America region, we're typically seeing a combination of phases one, two, and three at the household level. Now, as we go from household level classification to area level classification, what we're doing here is ensuring that to classify at the area level, we do have at least 20% of a given area's population meeting the criteria for that phase. But we recognize that there's likely households within that area that are experiencing different phases. So an example is in the middle of the slide at the bottom, we have a hypothetical area classification for crisis. And here we can see that most households are actually able or minimally able to meet their food needs, um, but we do have at least 20% of households in crisis or worse. 
And so that would then result in the overall area classification of phase three. I do want to point out that uh, phase three classification can look very different in different contexts. So we might see higher or lower percentages of households facing those outcomes. And there may be some instances, although it's certainly not necessarily the case, where some households in an area classified in phase three could be facing worse outcomes. The last thing to note in terms of classification is that in our maps, we place an exclamation point in a given area in order to indicate that ongoing or programmed humanitarian food assistance is mitigating worse secu food security outcomes in this area and that without it, the classified phase would likely be at least one phase worse. All right, so let's dive right into Central America. And so our key messages for the region are that most poor rural households have been able to partially offset above average prices due to near average income earned during peak demand for agricultural labor. Through May, most areas will continue to experience stressed or IPC phase two outcomes, but as labor opportunities diminish and the annual lean season sets in, minimal stocks of staple grain and the high cost of living will push these households to further limit the quality and quantity of food consumed and employ additional coping strategies. An increase in households experiencing crisis or IPC phase three outcomes is most likely during the peak of the lean season between June and August. With additional areas experiencing these outcomes, especially in localized parts of the dry corridor in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. In some areas of the Guatemalan dry corridor in the Guatemalan Western Altiplano and Altavera Paz Department, crisis or IPC phase three outcomes are most likely for the duration of the outlook period as poorer households in these areas have been unable to recover from shocks in previous years. Purchasing power for poor households is expected to remain below average due to the above average cost of living. Despite anticipated reductions in headline and food inflation compared to last year, prices of staple grains are expected to remain well above the five-year average throughout the outlook period. Recently generated income is being allocated to the purchase of basic foodstuffs and the payment of atypical debts, but this is limiting the savings capacity of poor households to compensate for seasonal declines in both income and labor demand during the peak of the lean season. This year, employment opportunities for the cultivation of maize and beans will be reduced due to cutbacks in production costs and a projected decrease in rainfall. Lastly, climate forecasts for the region indicate high probabilities of below average rainfall and above average temperatures, resulting in an irregular start to the Primera season, delays in planting, and reductions in labor demand during the outlook period. Although national staple grain production is still expected to be within average ranges across all four countries, and this is due to irrigation for commercial growers, we do still expect that subsistence farmers will continue to face above average prices for agricultural inputs that will limit their cropped area. Also below average rainfall will result in moderate crop losses, reducing anticipated harvests for the Primera season for subsistence farmers to below average. And with that, let's take a look at the current situation across the region. We'll start off first with the uh, region seasonal calendar. And so peak demand for agricultural labor wound down already in February. And the last of the Postrera Tardia and Aponte harvests also finished up between February and March. The lean season typically starts in April and lasts until August. Uh, but this year, localized areas have already entered the lean season. So there's been a slight, slight early start to the lean season this year. The Primera season will start towards the end of this month as the first rainy season begins, and the harvests for Primera are expected in late August and early September. Right after the Primera harvests, households will begin to sow for the Postrera season just as the second rainy season takes off. And I'm going to start in first with um, the economic situation across the region. So in general, economies across the region are continuing to recover from the height of the pandemic. Um, but we have started to see economic growth beginning to slow. And that's in line with international trends with inflation muting recovery in several sectors. Now, in the graphs shown on this slide, we can see that uh, the significant increases in activity both for imports, which is shown on the left, as well as for exports, which is shown on the right, 
those increases in activity that were registered in early 2022 have gradually started to slow um, since about mid-year last year. Towards the end of the year last year, we started to see some year-on-year -year declines, particularly for exports as well. In this context, though, most urban households have been seeing stable labor demand, but wages have not yet reached pre-pandemic levels, particularly not for those uh, engaged in the informal economy. Tourism activity, which supports livelihoods for households in multiple parts of the regions, is still showing sustained year-on-year -year growth and overall gradual recovery, but the number of annual visits is still falling short of those pre-pandemic levels. And this is due to the fact that rising prices and high inflation in tourists' home countries or in tourists' home areas are still constraining households' ability to travel. Lastly, we see a similar trend ongoing for remittances, which do continue to trend upwards compared to previous years, but their pace is beginning to slow given those economic realities in the countries of origin. Just as a quick reminder, remittances are not typically received by poorer households in the region, but they can indirectly benefit poorer households as middle and better off households tend to increase their spending in their communities. And sometimes they also hire more labor with those remittances. So for cash crops, which as I mentioned, we just ended uh, the main season for agricultural labor. Um, cash crops, including sugarcane, bananas, African palm, vegetables, and most coffee producers enjoyed pretty typical ranges for wage rates this year. But in our last briefing, we did mention that some areas reported uh, very tight labor markets with below average labor supply, and that in these areas, it had resulted in a modest increase in daily wages paid. So I want to follow up on that briefly. So through key informants and then our own visits to the field in recent months, we have confirmed that decreases in the availability of day laborers through permanent migration in recent years. And this has forced slight increases in wage rates in localized areas of the region. So for example, in Huehuetenango in Guatemala, daily wages during the 2022 to 23 season rose by about 10 to 25 quetzales to a total of about 50 to 75 quetzales per day or per 100 pounds of coffee cut. This is equivalent to an increase of between 25 and 50 percent compared to the daily wages in 2019 pre-pandemic. Similarly, payment for farm labor, mainly for maize preparation and planting activities, um, also in Huehuetenango, has increased by about 5 to 10 quetzales per day compared to 2019. Now, these increases do mean higher incomes for day laborers, but they also increase production costs which means that only larger producers in affected areas have been able to afford them. For small and medium-sized coffee producers, such as what is shown here in the photo on the right in Huehuetenango, wages have not risen in the same manner and demand for manual labor remained below average this season given high input costs. Moving on to recent staple grain crop production, the last cycle of the year, the Postura tardia or Aponte, did result in near average crop production, mostly thanks to positive soil moisture conditions and vegetative health at the end of last year and the beginning of this year. And you can see those positive vegetative health conditions in the map on the left. So the areas that produce mostly beans during this cycle are circled here in brown. They're in Northern Guatemala, Northern Honduras, and Central Nicaragua. And those beans, which we're seeing an example on the right in the photo here, the flow of beans um, from these harvests to the market did help keep market price, or I'm sorry, market supply at normal levels. But we'll talk about this in just a minute. We did not see positive impacts to prices from these harvests. Now, despite those positive soil moisture and vegetative health conditions that I mentioned we saw through about February of this year, the region has seen erratic rainfall throughout the month of March in the lead up to the planting for the Primera season. The map on the left is showing uh, some of this erratic rainfall from March 1st to April 5th. But so far, this has not been hindering the clearing and preparing of fields, which we can see an example of in Quiche, Guatemala on the right. And we'll discuss a little bit later in the presentation what impacts we expect for the beginning of the planting for the Primera season.
turning to look at markets and prices, although the market has remained well supplied and operating normally, typical seasonal declines in prices have been either minimal or non-existent. And unfortunately, as I mentioned, this trend has continued with the release of the recent Postura tardia or Aponte harvests. In the graph on the left here, you can see that in February, prices for maize remained between nearly 20 and about 45% higher than last year, and then between about 50 and 80% higher than the five-year average throughout the region. Similarly, for bean prices, we saw year-on-year -year price increases in February ranging from about 10 to 70%, as well as increases of between 40 and 80% across the region compared to the five-year average. We also do take a lot of note of fertilizer prices in Central America, and they are still tracking international trends, which you can see here in the graph on the left. So far in 2023, carryover stocks from 2022, which were purchased at the height of prices last year, are keeping the prices a little bit higher than international trends in several countries. But we would note that overall, the prices remain well above average across the region. So for example, in February, the price of urea in US dollars per kilogram in Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua, and El Salvador were 55, 85, 107, and 119 percent above the five-year average, respectively. Now, that difference, though, between the regional prices and the international prices, that is expected to diminish in the coming months. And regional prices will start to track international prices more closely starting in about May when governments, particularly the governments of Guatemala and El Salvador, start to make large purchases on international markets in order to support the upcoming season. Meanwhile, headline, headline inflation in the region is starting to see some slight increases um, after a period of stability and declines. So. El Salvador's inflation rate has remained stable, as we can see here in the graph on the right, but there are some slight increases between January and February of this year for Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. And I will just note very quickly that the latest inflation data, which will be included in our forthcoming April reports and analysis, those latest reports do show reductions in headline inflation rates across um, all four countries in the region in March. In some instances, they've actually headed back down to levels that we haven't seen in many months. In El Salvador, for example, it's the lowest it's been over the last year. So there is some good news coming on the inflation front, uh, but we'll be discussing that in much more detail in our April reports. So now I'll turn to our key assumptions through September of 2023. And we've already discussed the erratic rainfall at the beginning of the first rainy season, and we do anticipate that that erratic rainfall is likely to delay planting for the primera season. Looking further ahead into the season, though, climate forecasts are showing below average rainfall throughout the projection period. And you can see that that is the case in those climate forecasts um, on the left here with rainfall probabilities for the June to August period. And they're also forecasting above average temperatures, which is shown here in the map on the right, also for June to August. This is likely to coincide with an extended canicula or dry spell, which typically occurs around uh, July. Now this combination of climate factors is anticipated to cause some primera crop losses, as well as the delay for planting during the pastura season, especially for subsistence farmers in the region's dry corridor. Increased temperatures may also increase the likelihood of disease outbreaks, but thanks to irrigated commercial production, national production levels across the region are still expected to be within normal ranges. Fertilizer prices will remain above average, but will be below the spikes that we saw last year, and this will cause a reduction in cropped area similar to what we experienced in 2022, for both subsistence farmers of staple grains and small producers of cash crops. Agricultural labor demand throughout the outlook period is likely to be average for large scale producers, but below average, but similar to 2022 for small scale producers. And that's due again to persistently high um, production costs and those poor climate forecasts. More broadly in the economy, non-agricultural employment, including informal work as well as tourism, is all expected to gradually recover, but remains slightly below pre-pandemic levels, 
given the slowing of economic growth. Remittances are also expected to stay above last year and five-year average levels, but their rate of increase will uh, begin to slow as well. Headline inflation and food inflation are both expected to remain elevated to levels well above inflation targets for the duration of the outlook period, but they'll be below last year's peaks. Prices for fuel, transportation, and basic services will all remain above average as well. And FuseNet price projections for staple grains do show a seasonal rise beginning about now as the 2022 harvests have come to an end. The prices will remain above the five-year average throughout the analysis period. An example of that is that we're seeing here the technical price projections for beans and maize in Guatemala City, and they do show some moderation in the rate of increase, but prices are still sustained between 30 and 40 percent above average for beans, as shown here on the left, as well as between 60 and 70 percent above average for maize, as shown here on the right. At the end of the projection period, we do anticipate a modest decline uh, with the release of the Primera harvest by early September, um, but prices will still remain above average. So let's take a look at what this all means in terms of projected food security outcomes. And as you can see here on the left, we are showing our most likely outcomes for February to May of 2023. And then on the right, we have our most likely outcomes for June to September of 2023. Please note again that FuseNet does have a remote monitoring posture in Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. So the outlines that you see in those three countries indicate that there is at least one area within the country that's facing the phase indicated. So urban areas across the region are expected to maintain minimal or IPC phase one outcomes. So I'm going to focus in instead on the rural areas. Now, in most rural areas across the region, the reduction of poor households purchasing power has pushed them to adjust the quality and diversity of food in their diets and to cut back on non-essential expenditures to cover their food needs. This is likely to continue throughout the outlook period, resulting in stressed or IPC phase two outcomes through September in most rural areas. An increase in households experiencing crisis or IPC phase three outcomes is most likely during the peak of the lean season between June and August, with some additional areas experiencing these outcomes. Those additional areas will be located in the dry corridor in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. In these areas, sporadic agricultural labor demand will be below average, while food and transportation prices remain elevated just as households are most market dependent. And now until the arrival of the Primera harvests, very poor households in these areas will be cutting back on food quantity, will be taking on unsustainable debt, resorting to atypical migration for additional household members, and potentially selling productive assets as well. And lastly, I would note that worst affected areas of Guatemala, which are in the Eastern Dry Corridor, Western Altiplano, and an Altavera Paz department, are expected to face crisis or IPC phase three outcomes for the duration of the outlook period. For these areas, this is due to the fact that poorer households um, have incurred significant deaths in recent years, and they've been producing below average volumes of staple grains in recent years, both of which has been forcing prolonged market dependence. And with that, I'd just like to thank everyone for their time and attention this morning, and we'd be happy to take any questions you may have.